Before we get started on today's episode, I did want to do a little precursor here. Even though I am Texan and uh, live in Central Texas, my Spanish is horrible. So, although we're covering an entire video on bandits from Mexico, um, I'm going to do my best to pronounce them. I know I'm probably going to butcher a lot of names, but please just forgive me on the stuff for the storytelling's sake. Um, and I hope you enjoy. Jesus Arriga, famously known as Chucho El Roto, was a Mexican bandit active in the late 19th century. His intriguing life has inspired numerous books, plays, and other media. Born in 1858 in the state of Tlaxcala, his real name was Jesus Arriga, with the nickname Chucho being a common diminutive of Jesus in Spanish and Roto translating to discarded or ragged. Despite being a promising student, he had to quit school after his father's death to support his mother and sister. His journey led him to Mexico City, where he worked as a carpenter for a wealthy family. A romantic entanglement and an unplanned pregnancy resulted in his forced separation from his family. Chucho's career as a bandit took off in the late 1870s and early 1880s, gaining fame for his ability to navigate Mexico's socio-economic circles and targeting the wealthy. Despite his humble beginnings, he developed a reputation for appreciating fine clothes, theater, and sharing some of his spoils with the less fortunate, leading to comparisons with the famous Robin Hood of England. Chucho's notoriety was fueled by newspaper accounts, portraying him as a daring and clever figure. His ability to infiltrate upper social circles set him apart from other bandits of the time. Despite being arrested multiple times, he managed to escape, showcasing his elusive nature. In 1884, Chucho was finally arrested while he was posing as a coffee seller. His arrest revealed a complex personal life, including a longtime companion named Maria Bermillo and a daughter in Mexico City. The arrest also exposed his involvement in various crimes, leading to his transfer to the notorious San Juan de Eluva prison in Veracruz. Chucho's death is actually shrouded in mystery. In 1885, different accounts suggested he either died in a conflict with fellow prisoners or succumbed to injuries sustained during an escape attempt. The unsanitary conditions of the prison were notorious for causing diseases and death. Chucho El Roto's legacy emerged from newspaper accounts with early depictions focusing on his affinity for the arts and his supposedly nonviolent crimes. The first literary work based on him, Diego Corrientes, was published just before his death. His modern image evolved during the Porifio Diaz presidency and the Mexican Revolution, portraying him as an anti-hero challenging social inequalities. Chucho's depiction as a Robin Hood figure persisted into the 20th century through films, novels, radio shows, and even restaurants bearing his name. The ongoing fascination with his story raises questions about the political and cultural impact of famous bandits like Chucho in the 19th century Mexico, with studies exploring their potential role as models for popular descent. Heraclio Bernal, known as the Thunderbolt of Sinaloa, was a notorious bandit hailing from the Sinaloa region of Mexico. During his bandit years, Bernal led a group of pistoleros in the mining zones of the Sierra Madre Occidental, controlling parts of Sinaloa and Durango. His band reportedly numbering up to a hundred men engaged in various illegal activities including robbing stagecoaches, attacking armories, raiding mines for silver, and plundering the wealthy residents of towns they targeted. Despite his criminal pursuits, Bernal managed to elude capture for ten years forming strong connections with the lower class and influential figures in the region. They were suspicious that police and soldiers might have facilitated Bernal and other bandits by selling them weapons and ammunition. Governor Francisco Canedo, a local authority, actively pursued Bernal, leading to confrontations and mocking exchanges between them. Bernal's daring challenges extended to President uh, Perifrio Diaz, which we re referenced earlier, and legends abound, such as Bernal hosting a more extravagant dinner than Diaz in a neighboring town. Although the veracity of these stories is unquestionable, they elevated Bernal to a hero in the eyes of the surrounding village people. 
1883, Bernal's group was joined by the Para brothers, and in 1885, Bernal attempted to enter government service. He proposed a deal to President Diaz, seeking 30,000 pesos for himself and his security in exchange for serving as an officer. Additionally, he demanded the release of a capture of his captured gang members, including his imprisoned brother. Diaz rejected the offer, potentially denying Bernal a pardon due to the high payment request. In 1887, Bernal transitioned into the role of a political rebel, uh, advocating for the return uh, to his 1857 Constitution of Mexico, which prohibited repeating re-elections of the same candidate. However, this uh, initiative faced opposition, as many who might have supported Bernal now favored Diaz uh, for his repeated re-elections to maintain control. The government responded by deploying soldiers um, to the Mastelan region and forming anti-guerrilla forces to hunt down Bernal. A 10,000 peso ransom was placed on his capture, leading to an ambush set up by two of his own gang members. Heraclio Bernal met his demise on January 5th of 1888. Red Lopez, born Rafael Lopez, around 1886, gained notoriety as a Mexican outlaw responsible for at least 30 known murders in northern Mexico and the American Southwest. His tumultuous life saw him fighting in the, Ameri the Mexican Revolution, excuse me, eventually meeting his end in a shootout with American Frank Hamer, a Texas Ranger. Red Lopez was born in northern Mexico around 1886. His mother was of Indian descent, and his father, Martin Lopez, later became a general in Pancho Villa's army. Lopez's uncle, pa uh, Pablo Lopez, was another Vista general infamous for the Santa Isabel massacre in 1916. Lopez and his younger brother were sent to work in the mines in New Mexico Territory during their youth. While there, Lopez honed his skills as an equestrian and marksman. By 1913, he joined Buffalo Bill's Co Bill Cody's Wild West show, showcasing his talents nationally and internationally. In 1913, Red Lopez shot and killed a fellow miner, Juan Valdez, in Bingham, Utah, sparking a deadly encounter with law enforcement. A posse pursued him, leading to a shootout where Lopez killed the Bingham police chief and wounded two deputies. The ensuing manhunt involved around 200 men. It became the largest in Utah's history. Despite efforts to smoke him out and starve him into submission, Lopez escaped the uh, mini silver mine, marking the deadliest shootout in Utah law enforcement history. Red Lopez fled to Texas after his escape from Utah, and he rose to lead an outlaw gang that was allegedly composed of former members of Butch Cassidy's Wild Bunch. He engaged in bank and train robberies along the Rio Grande and participated in the Mexican Revolution. In 1914, near the international border, Lopez and his gang derailed the train, robbed it, and brutally killed 19 American passengers. The Texas Rangers initiated a pursuit, but Lopez eluded capture for years. In October of 1921, Frank Hamer, commanding uh, Company C, Texas Rangers, ambushed Lopez near the Rio Grande. Acting on an informant's tip, Hamer suggested a suspected trap, repositioning his men. As the outlaws approached, Hamer issued a warning in Spanish, prompting Lopez to fire. In the ensuing firefight, Lopez was killed along with 11 other bandits. Hamer's Gray's wounded, uh, wound marked the only injury amongst all of the Rangers, so Hamer was grazed by a bullet, and that's it. That's all they had. Uh, despite Lopez's death and the defeat of his gang, the Texas Rangers kept Utah authorities uninformed. So technically, the Lopez case remained open until January 24th of 2003 from his escapades in Utah before he fled to Texas. The case was remained until January 24th of 2003 when Deputy Sheriff Randy Lish confirmed their connection, officially closing the case after all the years of investigation. Silvestro Pedro Morales, a notorious serial bandit, etched his name into California history during the tumultuous 1880s. His exploits, marked by a deliberate coolness in his criminal endeavors, captured the attention of the public and law enforcement alike, earning him a reputation that was deemed unparalleled. 
In 1881, Morales catapulted into notoriety when he shot a Jewish merchant, leading to a seven-year sentence in the famous San Quentin prison. Released in February of 1889, he resumed his criminal activities, perpetrating crimes ranging from shooting, uh, shootings to horse theft. On July 23rd, Morales robbed and shot a man, adding to his list of offenses. The following day, Marshal Keno Wilson initiated a pursuit to apprehend Morales, setting the stage for a series of dramatic events. Morales, exhibiting a propensity for violence, engaged in a fight with George Bunch on August 20th, further intensifying the manhunt. Amid the chaos, Morales captured Nymphia Brown, kind of crazy name, a stepdaughter of an unrelated man named Jose Morales. The ensuing search party led by Jose encountered difficulties in tracking down the elusive bandit. On August 25th of 1889, Morales committed a heinous act, murdering San Juan Capistrano rancher Henry Charles. This sparked an escalation in the manhunt, with multiple rewards offered for Morales' arrest. The intensifying pursuit drew attention from law enforcement and private citizens alike. By early uh, September of 1889, Marshal Kino Wilson, aided by Ignacio Castillo and Johnny McGarvin, successfully apprehended Morales after days of careful surveillance. Nymphia, who had developed a form of Stockholm Syndrome during her time with Morales, stayed with him out of fear. During the trial, Morales, defiant and vengeful, vowed retribution against Wilson and Castillo. Despite receiving a life sentence uh, at uh, San Quentin Prison again, Morales found a way to manipulate the system. In 1909, Morales seemingly displayed good behavior, secured an early release from San Quentin. However, his release was a ruse, a calculated move to exact revenge on Wilson and Castillo. The vendetta was realized on October 14th of 1910, when Morales killed Castillo at his ranch house in San Diego. Wilson, leading an extensive search in both California and Mexico, failed to apprehend Morales, who eluded, who eluded capture, leaving a trail of mystery in his wake. Silvestro Pedro Morales, with his audacious uh, criminal career, remains a captivating figure in California history, leaving a mark on the narrative of the Wild West. Manuel Lozada, born to Naberto Garcia and Cecilia Gonzalez in 1828, faced a lot of early challenges. Orphaned at a young age, he was adopted by his uncle, Jose Maria Lozada, whose surname he embraced. As a child, he assisted in caring for animals on the family farm, which made him unable to complete elementary school due to family obligations. Legend has it that Lozada grew into a cowboy onto the Cicero Blanca Hacienda. His life took a dramatic turn when he eloped with Maria Dolores, leading to arrests and escape, eventually finding refuge in, in the Sierra de Alicia, which where he found his nickname was the Tiger of Alicia, or Alyssa. Accounts vary in Lozada's early years. In one version, he suffered public whipping by a soldier named Simon Morales, uh, sparking his transformation into the Tiger of Alicia. Uh, in another, he emerged as a bandit during the 1855-56 to 56 dispute in Tepic, later aligning with the Rivera's family and engaging in conflicts against government troops. Lozada's notoriety grew as he defeated government forces and attacked Tepic uh, in 1859. During the French intervention in 1860, he allied with the French, receiving recognition and awards. However, as the French Empire crumbled in 1866, at least there on in uh, this part of the world, not in France, uh, Lozada switched sides, declaring allegiance to the Mexican Republic and Juarez. After Juarez's death in 1872, his successor, Sebastian Lerdo de Tejera, uh, turned against Lozada. General Ramon Corona, uh, Lozada's sworn enemy, played a crucial role in his capture. Betrayed by his lieutenants, Lozada was apprehended while bathing in Loma de, de los Metas uh, and similarly executed in July 19th of 1873. Legal rights were suspended for those labeled as bandits, which he was. Despite his death, the central government struggled for a decade to control Tepic. Manuel Lozada is regarded as a precursor uh, to the agrarian reform movement in Mexico and indirectly contributed to the creation of the state of Nayarit. Monuments in his honor stand in Tepic in his birthplace, San Luis de Lozada. Joaquin Marietta Carrillo, 
also known as the Robin Hood of the West or the Robin Hood of El Dorado, remains a figure of disputed uh, history in Mexican lore. Born around 1829 and purportedly meeting his end on July 25th of 1853, Murrieta's tale has been intertwined with myth and legend with John Rowland Ridge's 1854 novel, The Life and Adventures of Joaquin Murrieta, the celebrated California bandit serving as the foundational narrative. Legends about the notorious outlaw during the California Gold Rush abound, yet historical evidence for a tangible Murrieta is pretty uh, scant. Contemporary documents mention a minor horse thief bearing his name in 1852, while newspapers reported on a bandito named Joaquin committing wa- robberies and murders during the same period. The California Ranger Harry Love was tasked with tra- tracking down Marietta and reportedly claimed a bounty for bringing his head. According to popular lore, Marietta was a peaceful 49er and a gold miner and a vaquero from Sonora, vaquero being like a Mexican cowboy. His turn to violence was supposedly triggered by false accusations against him and his brother, leading to his brother's hanging and Marietta's horse whipping. His wife suffered from unspeakable harm, intensifying Marietta's desire for revenge. He embarked on a brief but intense rampage against those he deemed responsible. The state of California offered a substantial reward for his capture, dead or alive. Although reported uh, he was killed in 1853, disputes arose about the certainty of his demise, giving his uh, a given rise to his myths and about his survival. Historian Susan Lee Johnson acknowledges the difficulty in like untangling the fact from fiction in Marietta's story. The consensus revolves around Anglos driving him from a lucrative mining claim, followed by a series of tragedies, including the lynching of his half-brother and Marietta's horsewhipping. Whether he worked as a Monty dealer, a horse trader, or a bandit remains debated. By 1853, the California legislature listed Marietta among the five Joaquins, uh, prompting the creation of the California Rangers led by Captain Harry Love, which we mentioned earlier. On July 25th, 1853, a confrontation near Arroyo de Cantua resulted in three Mexican men killed, including one identified as Marietta. Love and his rangers claimed the bounty, displaying Marietta's alleged head in a jar. Subsequent tours of the Grossum exhibit raised questions about this authenticity. The legacy of Marietta continues to evolve, with myths emerging about his survival. The destruction of his preserved head in the 1906 San Francisco earthquake added to his enigma. Marietta's nephew, Procopio, continued the bandit uh, legacy in 1860s and 1870s, which we'll be covering actually next. Um, And it is also believed that Marietta is the one who inspired the fictional character Zorro, as depicted by Johnson McCauley's 1919 novel. For some political activists, Marietta symbolizes Mexican resistance against Anglo-American dominance in California. Our last Mexican bandit is one we kind of mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, but this is Procopio, who was Marietta's uh, nephew. He's also known as Red-Handed Babito and, uh, YouTube, please don't cancel this, (laughs) a red dick. Uh, And he was a notorious bandit uh, in California. His nickname derived from either his red hair or his violent and bloodthirsty nature. He has various reported names, including Tommaso Redendo, Tomas Procopio, uh, Tomas Redondo, Procopio Marietta, um, lots of names. Um, But in 1872, the San Francisco Chronicle described him as one of the most fearless and daring desperados that they have ever uh, seen. Procopio was born in Mexico, possibly in Sonora. His parents of mixed Spanish origin were described as having roving habits. His father was a vaquero and Procopio learned the trade at an early age. His mother was the older sister of Joaquin Mar- Marietta, the famous, ban- the infamous bandit that we just covered. After his father's death in 1852, Marietta brought Procopio and his mother to California. Marietta's death in 1853, orchestrated by rangers who displayed his head, left a lasting impact on Procopio. It is said that witnessing his uncle's death led to Procopio to adopt his name. As a youth, he gained a reputation as a fearless writer and as being completely reckless. 
In 1862, Procopio was suspected in the murder of a rancher named John Rains in Southern California, but was released due to insufficient evidence. He later led a gang in the Livermore Valley suspected of the brutal Golding family mur murders in 1863. Procopio and his gang were arrested, but again released due to lack of evidence or conflicting accounts. He was arrested in 1863 for cattle theft, uh, and Procopio was convicted and sentenced to nine years in San Quentin. During his trial, he took full blame, exonerating his accomplice, um, and he was released in 1871. After his release, Procopio resumed his criminal activities, allegedly teaming up um, with a man named Tiberio, per, Tibercio Vasquez, excuse me, and they engaged in stagecoach robberies. And Procopio was arrested for complicity in a murder, but could not be linked um, to that, like with actual evidence. He was convicted uh, for cattle theft again and sentenced to seven more years in San Quentin. For all then, June of 1877. Procopio uh, returned to banditry, leading a gang near Fresno, Grangeville, uh, and Caliente. Captured near Tejon Pass, five members of his gang were lynched. Procopio uh, escaped, forming a new gang, and his uh, criminal activities pretty much just kept going. So as soon as he was caught and let go, he just went right back to it. So not much reform in those early prisons, and really not much reform now, but that's for another another story. Um, there are conflicting accounts of Procopio's later years. Some reports indicate he continued banditry as late as 1882, while others suggest that he died in Sonora, Mexico in 1882 or the early 1890s. Folklore surrounding Procopio's exploits grew over time, portraying him as a bloodthirsty and ruthless figure. In 1925, the Los Angeles Times published a profile that further embellished Procopio's legend, describing him as one of California's most fearsome bandits known for his cruelty. Charles Allen, who went by the infamous moniker Big Time Charlie, left a mark on the seedy underbelly of early 20th century Denver, Colorado. His arrival in 1916 marked the inception of one of the most sprawling and illicit prostitute enterprises the city had ever witnessed. Before his arrival in Denver, Charles Allen was a man of tall tales, having ventured into the Alaskan gold strikes and even riding alongside the legendary Pancho Villa in Mexico. However, upon his arrival in the Mile High City, he embarked on a path far removed from his adventurous past. Using a cunning blend of allure and deception, he ensnared women into the dark world of prostitution. What set his operation apart was his sinister practice of introducing young girls to the clutches of heroin and opium, ensnaring them in addictions before dispatching them to numerous cribs and bordellos. Shockingly, these women received compensation not in currency, but in the form of dangerous drugs. In a remarkably brief four-year period following his arrival, Charles Allen amassed an astonishing fortune, crossing the million-dollar threshold. Astonishingly, he siphoned off half of his wealth to appease Denver authorities, effectively buying their silence and complicity in his thriving prostitution empire. The city turned a blind eye to the dark underbelly until Big Time Charlie ventured into the wholesale distribution of narcotics, pushing the boundaries of tolerance to their limits. In 1919, the law finally caught up with Charles Allen. Authorities descended upon his residence, unearthing significant quantities of heroin and opium. This marked the pivotal turning point in the saga of the notorious Kingpin. Big Time Charlie found himself sentenced to a five-year term in the infamous Leavenworth Penitentiary in Kansas for his illegal drug trafficking activities. With his imprisonment, the empire he had so ruthlessly built crumbled into disarray. The story of what became of Charles Allen, or Big Time Charlie, after his release from prison actually remains shrouded in secrecy, lost to history, and leaving us to wonder about the ultimate destiny of this figure of the Wild West. Meet the legendary, and somewhat unknown, Apache Kid, a name that resonates with notoriety in the late 19th century. Born in 1860s on the San Carlos Reservation in Arizona, the kid, whose true name was Hoske Bay Ne Natel, was likely of White Mountain Apache descent. 
However, the citizens of Globe found his Native American name a bit challenging, so they simply called him the Kid. From a young age, he picked up English and took on various odd jobs in Globe, where he formed an unlikely friendship with the renowned scout, Al Seaver. During this era in the Southwest, settlers faced constant threats from marauding Apache bands. General George Crook devised a strategy to employ Apache scouts to track down hostile Apache groups. The Apache Kid joined the initiative in 1881, quickly proving his skills and earning a promotion to sergeant in July of 1882. The following year, he accompanied General George Crook on an expedition into the Sierra Madre. In 1885-1886, during the Geronimo Campaign, the Apache Kid found himself in Mexico with Seaver. When Seaver was called back to the U.S. in the fall, Kid followed, but then he re-enlisted for Mexican duty and headed back south in the Mexican town of Hasabas. A drunken brawl nearly cost the Apache Kid his life, but a lenient judge fined him $20 instead of sentencing him to death by firing squad. The army sent him back to San Carlos. In May of 1887, the Apache Kid was left in charge of Indian scouts and guardhouse at San Carlos while Captain Pierce and Al Sieber, his old friend, were away. During this time, a group of scouts decided to have an unlawful party um, where they made like a fermented fruit, corn beverage, essentially beer. Uh, tra tragically, this event led to the death of Kid's father, a man named Togo de Chuz, who was killed by a man named Gonzizi. In retaliation, Kid's friends killed Gonzizi and unsatisfied with the retribution, Kid went further and killed Gonzizi's brother. His brother's name is Rip. Upon returning to San Carlos on June 1st of 1887, the Apache Kid and other scouts were met by Captain Pierce and Al Sieber. When Pierce ordered the scouts to disarm, Kid was the first to comply. As they were being taken to the guardhouse, a shot rang out from the crowd and that had gathered to witness the event. Chaos erupted with shots fired indiscriminately. During this turmoil, the Apache Kid and several others managed to escape. Though it remains uncertain who fired the shot that hit Sieber, Sieber was the one who was hit, it undoubtedly it was for sure not the Apache Kid or the four scouts ordered in the guardhouse as they have been disarmed. In response, the army quickly dispatched two troops uh, of the 4th Cavalry to hunt down Kid and the other escapees. After two weeks of tracking along the San Carlos River, they located Kid and his group in the Rincon Mountains. The soldiers seized their horses and equipment, forcing the Apache to flee on foot into the rocky canyons. Kid communicated to General Miles that he and his group would surrender if the cavalry withdrew. Miles complied, and on June 25th of 1887, Apache Kid and seven of his followers surrendered. Following this surrender, the Apache Kid and four others were court-martialed, found guilty of mutiny and desertion, and sentenced to death by firing squad. General Miles, however, was dissatisfied with the outcome and ordered the court to reconsider the sentence. When the court reconvened on August 3rd, the sentences were reduced to life imprisonment. Miles later further reduced their sentences to 10 years. They began their sentence in the San Carlos guardhouse before being transferred to Alcatraz. Yes, the famous Alcatraz. However, their convictions were eventually overturned on October 13th due to bias amongst the officers in the court-martial trial. The Apache were released as free men and returned to the San Carlos, causing outrage among the local citizens. In October of 1889, a new warrant was issued in Gila County for the re-arrest of the Apache Kid this time for assault with intent to commit murder against his friend Al Sieber. On October 25th of 1889, the Apache Kid and three others were found guilty and sentenced to seven years in Yuma Territorial Prison. During their transport to the prison, a violent escape occurred, leading to the death of one guard and the injury to another. Kid played a role in preventing further harm to the wounded guard. Although the escapees managed to flee, their tracks were erased by the snowstorm, and this event marked the last official sighting of the Apache Kid. Although, unverified reports of his whereabouts would continue to resurface for years. Over the following years, Apache Kid was implicated in various crimes. He was said to have led a small band of renegade Apache followers, raiding ranches and freight lines across New Mexico and Arizona and northern Mexico. Some accounts describe him as a lone wolf, despite by his own people he was feared uh, as an Anglo settler. 
He was believed to kidnap Apache women, using them until he grew tired of them and before committing further violence. Reportedly, he targeted lone ranchers, cowboys, and prospectors, killing them for resources uh, and all, everything they had on their ranches. The Arizona Territorial Legislator even offered a $5,000 reward for his capture, dead or alive, but the reward remained unclaimed. The Apache Kid's legacy is a mosaic of differing accounts, crimes, and controversies, all stemming from his quest to, for revenge against the Army's treatment of the Apache Scouts. His enigmatic name, the tall man destined to come true to his mysterious end, seems to have foretold a life of intrigue and obscurity. Although the details surrounding his demise remain elusive, a memorial gravesite in the San Mateo Mountains of the Cibaloa National Forest in New Mexico stand as a testament to the legend of the Apache Kid. Local lore holds that Apache Kid met his end at the hands of vengeful ranchers in the area, marked by a tree scorched by their fury, a hunting reminder of Kid's turbulent life. This site is located one mile northwest of Apache Kid's peak at Cyclone Saddle, and that remains a piece of the Apache Kid's enduring legacy. Let's delve into the intriguing tale of George W. Brown, an alleged outlaw who was rumored to have connections with Henry Plummer's notorious game of The Innocents in the Wilds of Montana. George W. Brown's origins are believed to trace back to Minnesota, as he grew older, he entered the Union with a Sioux woman, and together they brought several children into the world. Brown's life took an adventurous turn during the Dakota War 1862 in Minnesota, when he took a role as a scout serving under the command of Lieutenant Colonel William Rainey Marshall. However, by 1863, Brown had ventured westward to the untamed lands of Montana, where he was rumored to have played a significant role within the ruthless game known as the Innocents. In the year 1863 marked an end to the Montana Gold Rush, a time when the concept of law was a mere notion in a region, and that there was a vast part of the territory of Idaho where there was still lawlessness. This was an era where road agents ran rampant, uh, terrorizing the region by plundering roads, ambushing stagecoaches, raiding freight caravans, and particularly targeting ore wagons laden with valuable gold shipments. These violent exploits resulted in tragic deaths of nearly 100 individuals. This, as you can imagine, infuriated locals who grew increasingly delusional with the slow and ineffective justice system, leading to the birth of the Montana Vigilantes. One of the prime suspects of the Vigilantes' radar was Erastus Red Yeager. The Vigilantes were embarked on a relentless mission to track him ultimately locating him in remote, stinking water valley within the Madison County. Yes, that is the weird name. Uh, in the company of Jaeger was none other than our new friend, George W. Brown. The vigilantes informed Jaeger that he would be transported back to Virginia City to face trial. While there exists no actual documented confession, the vigilantes claim that Jaeger made a comprehensive admission of guilt during their journey back to Virginia City. He not only revealed the identities of the majority of the road agents within the game, but also pointed an accusatory finger at Sheriff Henry Plummer, whom he identified as the leader. Following this revelation, both Jaeger and Brown faced a grim fate. They were deemed guilty by the posse and met their end on January 4th, 1864, where they were hanged from a sturdy branch of a cottonwood tree along the banks of the Ruby River, situated near Lauren, Montana. This location rested approximately 11 miles northwest of Virginia City. The vigilantes intentionally left the lifeless bodies hanging from the tree as a stark and chilling warning to anyone who would be outlaws. To further emphasize their point, a note was affixed to Jaeger's lifeless body, labeling him as Red, Road Agent and Messenger, while George Brown's received an ominous moniker, Brown, Corresponding Secretary. These grim reminders served as a stark testament to the uncompromising pursuit of justice in the untamed frontiers of Montana. Let me introduce our final outlaw of today's episode, a man named Charles or Charlie Bryant. He is also known as Blackface Charlie, whose life and exploits are woven into the fabric of Oklahoma's outlaw history. Charlie's journey takes us into the landscape of the Wild West adventures, gunfights, and his association with the notorious Dalton Gang. 
Charlie Bryant hailed from Wise County, Texas, and his journey into the world of outlaws began at a tender age. As a teenager, he embraced the life of a cowboy, immersing himself in the rugged ways of the frontier. However, fate took a dark turn when, still in his youth, he became entangled in a violent gunfight. The outcome was a face forever marked with the grains of black powder, a scar that earned him the moniker Blackface Charlie. In 1890, Charlie found himself drawn into the orbit of the infamous Dalton Gang. And if you don't know, it's a group of notorious uh, for their daring train robberies and audac audacious exploits. We'll be doing a full dive into the Dalton Gang in the future. His association with the gang would lead to his involvement in the brazen train robbery near Wharton, Oklahoma on May 9th of 1891, followed by another daring train heist near Red Rock just weeks later. Charlie Bryant was a man who harbored a deep affection for the art of gunplay, regardless of the circumstance. This um, affinity to trigger happy behavior often led to the Daltons questioning his reliability. His quick impulse and trigger finger uh, made him a form formidable yet unpredictable member of the gang. So his first was to quote the old uh, movie with Will Smith, Wild West, we uh, shoot first, ask questions later. That's kind of what I get from it. Uh, during a period when the gang ca camped near Buffalo Springs, Oklahoma, Charlie fell ill and his condition uh, needed medical attention. He was transported to a doctor near Hennessy while uh, in a hotel, news of his whereabouts reached the ears of U.S. Deputy Marshal, uh, Deputy Marshal Edward Short. Without hesitation, Short moved swiftly to apprehend the outlaw. On a fateful day of August 3rd of 1891, Short and Charlie boarded a train bound for the Federal District Court of Wichita, Kansas. Fate, however, had a cruel twist in store. Short made an unfortunate decision to tempor temporarily leave Black Charlie under the watchful eye of the express car messenger while he relieved himself. Believing Charlie to be asleep, uh, the messenger momentarily set the guard down and focused on his duties. Yet, Charlie, the ever-cunning outlaw, had merely been feigning sleep. In an audacious move, he seized the opportunity snatching the revolver from the unsuspecting messenger and upon Short's return, fired a fatal shot into the marshal's chest as he re-entered the car. A desperate gunfight ensued and Short swiftly retaliated using his rifle, resulting in catastrophic consequences. Charlie Bryant's chest was ravaged by the return fire, severing his spinal column. As the train rumbled on, the lifeless bodies of both men bore witness to the tragic climax of their encounter. When the train finally reached Waccamas, Oklahoma, it carried with it the weight of the deadly confrontation, leaving two men dead in an enduring tale of the Wild West. The story of Charles Charlie Bryant, the trigger finger outlaw, remains etched in the history as a testament to the unpredictable and unforgiving nature of the frontier life during that era. <laughs>